Good morning, boys and girls. Today we're going to read the next three chapters in our story, The Escape from Mr. Lemonzello's Library. Chapter 34. Veering left, the instant she reached the second floor, Haley made her way towards the 400s room. She figured that Charles and Andrew had probably missed something important in the foreign languages room because they'd spent too much time talking about talking to these awesome mannequins that they told her all about. And they told that told them all about their American heritage. As she rounded the bend, Haley saw Kyle Keeley and his crew tumble out of the 200s room. It looked like Miguel was carrying a Bible, but a Bible wasn't one of the books on the staff on the display in the staff picks case. We're following separate paths to the same goal, Haley thought, and somewhere those two paths are going to collide. Haley slid her key card down the reader slot for the 400s door. The lock clicked and she pushed op the door open. The room was dimly lit. Bienvenida, bienvenue, konnichiwa, welcome, boomed a voice from the ceiling. Speakers. Sorry, said Haley, blindly fo feeling her way toward in bumping into something hard and lumpy. This is the 400s room, home of the foreign languages. Here, Haley, you can learn all about your American heritage. A bank of spotlights thumped on. Haley was basically hugging a department store mannequin. An overhead projector beamed a movie onto the dummy to her left, turning it into a perky woman who looked like Haley would probably look in a couple of years after she gradu a couple of years after she graduated college. Hello, Haley. Welcome to your American heritage. Let's begin your voyage. That's okay. I don't have time right now. I'm Haley Dealey. My ancestors were Irish, okay? Can we skip the history lesson and... Suddenly, the two mannequins at the far end of the row turned into sepia-toned versions of her great-great-great-grandmother and her great-great-great-grandfather. Haley knew it was them because her dad had a bunch of old photos hanging in their living room. The two dummies looked exactly like Patrick and Una Daly did in their wedding photo. No man ever wore a scarf as warm as his daughter's arm around his neck, said Patrick in a thick Irish brogue. Your dad, your dad is proud of you, Haley. Thanks, but I really need to win this competition. Watch out for sneaky rascals, said Una. Them that would steal the sugar out of your punch. Haley had to smile. It sounded like her ancestor had met Charles Chillington. And always remember, Haley, said her great-great-grandfather, -grandfa every woman's mind is her kingdom. Rule it wisely, lassie. I'm trying. This library can help, her great-great-great-grandmother said with a wink. And what she did, and when she did, a secret panel in the wall slid open. What's going on, said Haley. You're our third visitor, boomed the jolly announcer in the ceiling. So, according to the American Heritage Dictionary of Idioms, available in our reference department, by the way, the third time is the charm. Therefore, as our third visitor, you have won this charming bonus. Two bonuses in one day? She was right. Mr. Lemoncello definitely wanted Haley Daly to win this game because clearly he knew she'd be the perfect best-looking spokesmodel for his holiday commercials. Don't worry, sir, Haley said to the nearest TV cameras. I won't let you down. She hurried through the open wall to the panel, to the panel and into the 300s room on the other side. Ta-da! The first thing she saw was one of the books they'd been searching for all day long. True Crime Ohio. The Buckeye State's Most Notorious Brands, Burglars, and Bandits by Claire Taylor Winters. She quickly opened the cover and found a hidden 4x4 card. It took her two seconds to decipher the clue. What do you think that could be? What are these people playing in? A... Plus it's, let's see, bandits. Haley remembered another bit of Irish wisdom, something her dad said to her all the time. Never bolt your door with a boiled carrot. What do you think that might mean? She decided to keep this new secret clue, this new clue secret and secure. She wouldn't share it with Charles or Andrew. Haley took off her left sneaker, folded the card in half, and slid the clue into her shoe for safekeeping. When her, sneak, when her sneak was laced up tight, she took the True Crime Ohio book off its display stand and tucked it into the bookshelf, making sure it was in the proper position, right between, between 364.1 and 
1091 and 364.1093. That way, she'd know where to find it if, for whatever reason, she needed the book again. Haley looked up at the nearest camera and flashed at her brightest toothpaste commercial smile. Go, Lemoncello! That's a cheer I made up. We can use it in one of the commercials after I win. Chapter 35. Entrance to community room... Community Meeting Room B will only be guaranteed to Kyle Keeley, Sierra Russell, Akimi Hughes, and Miguel Fernandez, said the soothing female voice in the ceiling after all the four teammates had swiped their cards through the meeting room door's sweeter slot. This makes sense, said Akimi. We need a place to organize all this material. Put it on the walls, draw a chart, like the FBI does on TV when they're trailing the mob. Stole the meeting room idea from me, eh, Keeley? Charles Chillington was standing in the doorway to meeting room A on the far side of the rotunda. No, said Kyle. We just needed some place to throw our victory party after we win. Not going to happen, Charles said smugly. Must I remind you, I'm a Chillington, and Chillingtons never lose. And he disappeared back into meeting room A. After Charles was gone, Kyle led his team into meeting room B. Miguel posted... The blank blueprints he had found up on the walls while Sierra set up the Bibliomania board game on the conference table. I'm glad this room won't let anybody else in, said Kyle. And by anybody, you mean Charles Chillington, right, said Akimi? Totally. Hold on one second, guys. And by anybody, you mean Charles Chillington, right, said Akimi? Totally. Akimi grabbed a marker and wrote a neat outline on the dry erase walls. Clues so far. Definite clues. One, from the Zero's room. Get to know your local library book. Two, from the Art and Artifacts room. <laughs> Willy Wonka. Candy rhymes with Andy. Find this elevator. Number three, from the 200's room. Bible verse. Thou shall not steal. Probably clues. And look at her list of clues here, guys. Book slash authors on the backs of library cards. Miguel Fernandez, number one, Miguel Fernandez. Incident at Hawks, it's me, bud. Incident at Hawks Hill by Alan W. E. Eckert and No David by David Shanahan. Book number, card number two, Akimi Hughes, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish by Dr. Seuss and Nine Stories by J.D. Salinger. Card number three, Unknown. Card number four, Bridget Wodge, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing by Judy Bloom, and Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Card number five, Sierra Russell, The Egypt Game by Zephilia Keatley Snyder, and The Weston Game by Ellen Raskin. Book number six, or I'm sorry, card number six, Yasmin Smith Snyder, Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne and the Yaku Yeld Yak by Carol Pugo Martin. Book number, card number seven, Sean Keegan, Olivia by Ian Falconer, and Unreal by Paul Jennings. Card number eight, Unknown. Card number nine, Rose Vermette, All of a Kind Family by Sidney Taylor, and Scat by Carl Heisen. Card number ten, Kayla Corson, Anna to the Infinite, Infinite Power by Mildred Ames, and Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. Card number eleven, Unknown. Card number twelve, Kyle Keeley. I Love You, Stinky Face by Lisa McCourt and The Napping House by Audrey Wood. Maybe clues. Statues ringed around the dome. Thomas Wolf Booker, Thomas Wolf, Booker T. Washington, Stephen Sondheim, George Orwell, Lewis Carroll, Dr. Seuss, Maya Angelou, Shel Silverstein, Sudanus Bach, and Todd Strazer. Wow, said Akimi, stepping back to study the walls. What an incredible mess. Yeah, said Kyle. Okay, guys, there are eight more book rooms to explore, and who knows how many more wild cards. Whose turn is it? Yours, said Sierra. Kyle flicked the spinner. Green, the 500s, science. He pulled the first green card from the deck. Four and 20 were once in a pie. 598.367 might tell you why. Blackbirds, said Miguel. I guess. Well, said Akimi, let's go check out another book. But there's, there's still like an inch or two left on our whiteboard. 
The 500 room was a miniature museum of the natural history. In addition to towering walls of books, there was a whole planetarium of stars and constellations projected on the ceilings. Models of plants whirled around their orbits. Sparkle-tailed comets shot around the corners of bookshelves. Kyle and his teammates made their way back to the, to the 590s. Zoology. Shelving units were arranged in a square around an open area, maybe 20 feet by 20 feet wide. The team entered the space. The lights dimmed and the guy with long hair who looked like an artist, Daniel Boone, faded into view. Who looked like artistic, an artistic Daniel, Daniel Boone, faded into view. He was wearing some kind of bear fur coat and toting a musket. Bonjour, said the hologram. It's John James Audubon, said Sierra, the famous ornithologist. Gives people braces, said Kyle. No, Sierra said with a laugh. He studied and painted birds. A black bird with a yellow beak flew into the open area and roosted on a tree branch. The bird and the tree were both holograms too. This beautiful black bear bird from Alexandriaville, Ohio, and the semi-transparent, said the semi-transparent Audubon image, Audubon, yeah, image, can mimic the sound, the song, it, mm, Image can mimic in song the sound it has heard, and the and the bird started wailing. Wow, said Kimmy, that sounds exactly like a police siren. Yo, said Miguel, that's freaky. To learn more, said Audubon, be sure to read bird songs, warbles, and whistles written by Diana Victoria Garcia, with classic il illustrations by Moi. And with that. He sat down on a camp stool. An easel appeared, and the blackbird struck a pose, and, and the outdoorsy artist started painting the bird's portrait while humming Blackbird by the Beatles. Okay, said Kyle, this is the strangest clue yet. Well, look, well, here's the book, at least, said Sierra, who had found 598.367 on the shelf. So what do blackbirds, whales, and warbles have to do with finding our way out of the library, said Akimi. And just then, they heard a very different sound. Behind one of the bookcases, something growled, then roared. Did you guys hear that? said Sierra. Yeah, said Akimi, and I don't think it's a robin redbreast. A very rare white Bengal tiger with icy blue eyeballs crept out from behind the wall of bookshelves and stalked into an open area where he sat painting his bird portrait. Uh... Is that another hologram? asked Miguel. Roar! No one stuck around to find out. Chapter 36. Down on the first floor, Charles and Andrew were working their way around the semicircle of three of three story tall floor to, floor to dome bookcases filled with fiction. It was nearly 8 p.m. We need to find that blasted book, said Charles, craning his neck to study the shelves. I'm getting kind of hungry, mumbled Andrew. You had a snack this afternoon, snapped Charles. Well, now it's time for dinner. No, we need to find Anne of Green Gables first. The classic by Lucy Maud Montgomery was the middle book on the top shelf of the stack picks display. So far, Charles, Haley, and Andrew had not been able to find it anywhere in the library. Unfortunately, said Andrew, they temporarily erased the book's call number from the database. So we would wouldn't know what to punch into the hover ladder's control panel, grumbled Carl. Charles. Actually, said Andrew, they might have shelled it in the children's room. Or maybe the 800s with the literature? Could be in the 400s, too, because it was originally written in Canadian, which is technically a foreign language. So you have said, Andrew, repeatedly. But we've already searched those other locations several times. It has to be here with the other fiction titles. You just need to fly up and find it. Well, said Andrew... I'm kind of afraid of heights. Fine, whatever. I'll go up and grab it, but you have to give me some kind of a call number to enter to the hover ladder. Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote other Anne books. There's Anne of Anvilly. Charles dashed over to the nearest library table and swiped his fingers across the glass of its built-in computer pad. Here we go. Anne of Anvilly. Avonlea. Avonlea? Avonlea? Uh, Avonlea? By Lucy Maud Montgomery. F-M-O-N. Yes, said Andrew. Fiction books are usually put on the shelf alphabetically by the author's last name. Nonfiction titles are classified according to the Dewey Decimal System. 
How long have you known this? Andrew's nose twitched since second grade. So all we ever needed was F-M-O-N. We could have found this book hours ago. Andrew gulped. You're such a disappointment. Shaking his head, Charles huffed over to one of the hover ladders. He quickly jabbed F-M-O-N into the keypad. The boot clamps clipped into place around his ankles. You owe me for wasting all this time, Andrew. You owe me big time. If you let me down once more, I swear I'll tell everybody you're a big, blubbering baby. I'll Twitter it, and I'll post it on Facebook. Don't worry. I'll make, I'll make you glad you picked me for your team, Charles. I promise. The hover ladder lifted off the floor and gently glided up to the M section of the fiction wall. Sh shuttling sideways, it carried Charles over to a shelf displaying the Anne books. He grabbed a copy of Anne of Green Gables, and as soon as he did, the ladder started to slow its descent to the floor. What'd you find? asked Andrew when Charles landed. The clue we needed. He showed Andrew the card that had been tucked inside the front cover. Okay, said Andrew. It's C plus hat. So the word chat, which by the way could also be chat, the French word for cat. Well done, Andrew, said Charles, even though he knew the clue was really C plus an equaling can, thereby making the puzzle you can walk out the way blank blank in in past blank. The way they did what, he wondered. What does in in mean? Charles desperately needed to find the three missing pictograms. Suddenly, Mr. Lemoncello's voice boomed out of speakers in the ring uh, speakers ringing the rotunda. Hey, Charles. Hey, Andrew. Let's do a deal. Game show music blared. A can crowd cheered. Charles turned around and saw shafts of colored light illuminating three envelopes perched on top of the librarian's round desk. Clarence's security guard marched into the reading room and folded his arms over his chest, took up a position near the three envelopes. We have a green envelope, a blue envelope, and a red envelope, said Mr. Lemoncello. In two of those three envelopes are copies of two of the three pictogram clues you still need. In, the, in one, there is a clunker card. If you pick an envelope with a clue, you get to keep it. And, it, and you get to keep going. But once you pick the clunker card, you are done, and you must suffer the consequences. Andrew raised his hand. Yes, Andrew. What are the consequences? Something bad, said Mr. Lemoncello. In fact, something wicked this way will probably come. Do you want to do a deal? Yes, said Charles. The audience, the canned audience cheered. All right then, Charles, you roll first. Pardon? Swipe your fingers across the nearest desktop computer panel. The, tum the Dice Tumblr app is up and running. Again, the pre-recorded audience cheered. They sounded like they loved watching Dice Tumble more than anything in the world. Charles slid his fingers across a glass pane. The animated dice rolled. Ooh, cried Mr. Lemoncello. Double sixes. That gives you twelve. Is that good, sir? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, Andrew, your turn. Pegaman tapped the glass and the dice flipped over. Ooh, another set of doubles, said Mr. Lemoncello. Yeah, said mumbled Charles. Two ones. Snake eyes. Is that bad? asked Andrew. Maybe, said Mr. Lemoncello. Maybe not. Okay, guys, which envelope would you like to open? Charles thought about it while the TikTok music played. They were given a chance to play Let's Do a Deal after they located the Anne of Green Gables clue. Coincidence? He didn't think so. We'll take the green envelope, sir. Clarence presented the envelope to Charles. Open it, said Andrew. Open it. Charles undid the clasp, pulled out a card, and a loud zonk rocked the room. The card was black with blocky white type. Uh-oh, mumbled Andrews. What does it say on that card? Sorry, kids, you are out of luck, read Charles. So out of the doors, you are now out of doors, you are now stuck. Clarence picked up the blue and red envelopes and marched back towards the entrance hall. What's that mean, said Andrew? Well, said Mr. Lemoncello, Charles rolled a 12 and you rolled a 2. What's 12 plus 2? 14, said Charles eagerly, the way he always did in math when he wanted to remind the teacher that he was the smartest kid in the class. Ooh, said Mr. Lemoncello, that is not good. In fact, I'd say it's stinkerific. Stinkerific, said Andrew, is that even a word? It is now, said Mr. Lemoncello. JJ, tell them what they've lost. An, alternate, an authoritative female voice boomed out of the ceiling speakers. Warning, 
Due to a clunker card, all 10 Dewey Decimal, system, Dewey Decimal doors will lock in 10 minutes at exactly 8 o'clock. If you are in one of those rooms, kindly leave immediately. The 10 doors on the second floor will remain locked for 14 hours. Andrew panicked. What? 14 hours? I told you. 12 plus 2 was bad, quipped Mr. Lemoncello. Of course, it could have been good. If you had picked one of the other envelopes, you would have received a clue and a free 14-month subscription to Library Journal. Charles did some quick math. Sir, does this mean that we'll be locked out of the 10 Dewey, Dewey Decimal Rooms until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Bingo, said Mr. Lemoncello. It sure does. This stinks, said Andrew. We need those stupid rooms to solve your stupid puzzle. Clunker cards stink. This game stinks. Fourteen-hour penalties stink. Charles did his best to block out Andrew's rant. He needed to think. Then it hit him. Kyle Keeley's team had to be working some other solutions to the bigger puzzle of how to escape the library. Otherwise, Charles and his team would not have been able to find the nine clues that they'd already picked up. Surely, if Keeley's team had been playing the same memory match game, they would have found at least one of the pictograms before Charles, Andrew, or Haley did. They must be working a completely different angle. Charles was certain that if he could use his downtime to learn what Keeley and his team had in their meeting room and combine it with his picture puzzle, he would encourage he would emerge from the library victorious. Don't despair, Andrew, Charles said confidently. We are still going to win. How? Charles leaned in, cupped his hands around his mouth, so no security cameras could read his lips. Remember, he whispered, you need to pay me back for wasting a ton of time on finding Anne of Green Gables. What? You're the one who picked the stupid green envelope with the stupid clunker card. Charles's eyes narrowed and chilled his, and a chill hushed his voice. So? Um, nothing, said Andrew nervously. Just thought I'd, you know, you know, point that out. Charles turned his eyes to blue ice, back into blue ice. So, whispered Andrew, swallowing hard, what exactly do you want me to do? Find a way to sneak into community meeting room B. Andrew wheezed in panic. That's impossible. Don't worry, I have an idea. What is it? Two words, Sierra Russell. We're going to stop there today.